In today's episode, we're heading back to the mountains and back into the gorge, but not the same gorge as we did last time. If you want to hear about Linville Gorge, you'll have to go back to episode 87. Today, we're going to be talking about Hickory Nut Gorge. Welcome to the NC Everything Podcast. I'm your host, Curtis, and this is the show where we talk about everything that has anything to do with North Carolina. It's also a show where if you want to skip straight to the content, look in the description below and you'll see a timestamp at the top. And that's exactly when the actual content starts. That way you can skip all the talking. Now, to start the talking, this episode here, I'm recording it Wednesday before the Saturday that it comes out. So if you're listening to this on Saturday, whatever that date is, um, the, the first Saturday when this show comes out, I just remembered that I had recorded it three days earlier. I say this because the last three episodes of the podcast I recorded, I think, all in the same day or in over a course of a couple days. So it's been a little while since, I, since I've actually sat down and recorded. And I can tell you, I have been been very busy. I'm not going to talk about my work at the beginning of every episode, but uh, as some of you know, I've recently got moved. I don't know if I should say promoted, but I got moved to welding supervisor. And what that entails is I've, I have been welding 19 years sitting in a box by myself. And now I'm in charge of 70 people and growing. And it's, it's been a struggle. Um, learning the, the job, the computer skills needed, that's been great. But there's, there's no amount of training that can get a person ready for, for the personnel. And I work with all men, so we're talking 70 men, 70 different personalities, a lot of them conflicting. They're real competitive. Um, everything turns into an issue, and I need them all to work together as a team. And they're not all 70 there at one time. It's three shifts. I'm, it's a 24-hour place, and I'm the, I'm the boss 24 hours a day. But I need all, all these 70 men throughout the shifts inner shift to work together as a team and uh it doesn't work too good and i'm about to start a project this week um probably tomorrow or thursday where it's going to require these 70 guys to work as a well-oiled machine and uh it's probably going to be disastrous but i um, i still got to go through and, and at least try it but uh but being the boss is is definitely a struggle i, I i'll tell you if, if you're ever thinking about doing it think think really hard. And because like I said, I was for 19 years and more or less been working by myself, headphones in my ear, listening to music and podcast. And now I'm, I'm treading HR waters and I'm dealing with production managers and safety managers and vice presidents and all sorts of supervisors and shift leaders. And it's, again, conflicting personalities, different ideas, different uh thoughts about how to do things it's it's rough and um uh, you know I'm, I'm i'm it's like it's like trying to herd a hundred jackrabbits on your hands and knees and i, I you know i'm making jokes and I, I i'm complaining a little bit the truth is i wouldn't have it any other way I, I started that company 19 years ago when i was 21 a 21 year old kid really so i kind of grew up in that company and it's it's my home so even though the job is hard and it's kicking my ass, I really wouldn't have it any other way. As some of you know, I, I'm a welder myself. I grew up welding. I grew up welding in this company. I love welding. And now it, it still seems surreal, but to be in charge of the entire welding operation at this company that I grew up in, it, you know, it, it, it makes me feel good. It's, I feel like I'm doing a good thing. And, you know, kind of like Jack, sparrow and pirates of the caribbean you know the black pearl if you know the pirates movie the black pearl it's all beat up and and wrecked but jack sparrow still gets on the wheel and holds his chest out high and that's his ship you know he doesn't care that's his ship and that's kind of how i am I, I i feel like i did just become the captain of a a messed up ship but it is my ship and so I'm going to straighten my hat and hold my chest out and drive that son of a bitch into hell, come what may, you know. And 
and I'm okay doing so. The, the, you know, this is my ship. Anyway, that's enough about work. Let's get on back to the podcast. Uh, if you like the show, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe, whether you're listening or watching. And if you are listening and you want to watch, there's a link for the YouTube uh, channel in the description below. And if you're watching and you'd rather just listen, I can be found on most podcast players. And while you're checking out the description, you can see a link to the Facebook group. And that's where I try to share as much North Carolina content as I can. A lot of my my followers, I guess you could call them, they, um, they also try to post some North Carolina content. And they also give me ideas for shows. Also, if you have an idea for a show, there's a, my, the email address is down there. And you can contact me and tell me what you think. And if you have an idea, please suggest it, and I'll put it in the list. And I say this all the time. You know, I love, I love hearing from the listeners. You know, uh, my wife sometimes will give me ideas and she's like, I know you already have enough to do. No, I, I love it. Um, I have plenty of my own content, but I like giving people what they want. And in order to do that, I need to know what people want. So definitely, if you have an idea, even if it's not for a show, if you have an idea of something for me to check out, uh, I love it. I'll, I'll definitely check it out. And let's see, the last thing before I get into the content, if you go to the YouTube channel, it's a YouTube only program, but my wife and I, and some of you already know, we started uh, Tasting NC, and we do that show together. It's a lot, it's a lot funner recording with my wife. I think just having somebody else there, not talking to the camera and sitting here talking to myself, but Tasting NC, we're trying to taste North Carolina foods, restaurants. It's all North Carolina. Um, we're, we, it's a monthly show. and even though it's a monthly show, sometimes we struggle to come up with ideas, but we're trying to come out with one the first Saturday of every month. I think we have three or four released now, but uh, if you get tired of listening or looking at just me, definitely check out Tasting NC under my under the NC Everything Podcast YouTube channel, and uh, and it's a, a little bit a little bit different than the NC Everything Podcast for sure. All right, well I think that's enough of that, so let's go ahead and get into the content. First, I want to say that this episode was suggested by Dave from Asheville. Thank you, Dave, for the suggestion. Thanks for reaching out. So we're going to be talking about Hickory Nut Gorge. And if you've never heard of it, it's up in Rutherford, Ruther, Rutherford County. Wow, that was actually a lot harder than I was expecting it to be. But Hickory Nut Gorge, it's a, it's a smaller gorge than Limbo Gorge. But I say it's a smaller gorge, but it's still 14 miles long. And the whole gorge is on about 20,000 acres up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. The canyon walls reach up about 1,800 feet in some places. And right in the middle of the gorge, the Rocky, Bro the Rocky Broad River cuts right through. It was this river that was responsible for cutting the gorge in the first place millions of years ago. And I actually don't know how old the, the gorge or canyon. I'll be using gorge and canyon, you know, uh, together. But... I don't know exactly how old the place is. I tried to find out, but I do know that the Blue Ridge Mountains are a billion years old. And to be precise, to be precise they're 1.1 billion years old, up to 250 million years old. It's kind of hard to, you know, to age mountains. But it was sometime during that window from a billion years ago to 250 million years ago that the Hickory Nut Gorge was carved out. Another interesting fact that I didn't know until I'd done the research is that the gorge itself is geographically the border between the North Carolina Piedmont and the North Carolina mountains. It sits right on the dividing line. And for me, when, I, when I'm heading up Interstate 40 to go to the mountains, I usually feel like I'm not really in the mountains until I get around Hickory. I mean, that's where you can really start seeing the, the peaks off on the horizon. Hickory is actually about 50 miles northeast of Hickory Nut Gorge. So it was when I'm at Hickory Nut Gorge, I feel like I'm still in the deep mountains, but truly you're not really, you're not really in the deep, deep mountains, I guess, until you get closer to the, the Tennessee state line, Cherokee over in that area. But Hickory Nut Gorge, if you ever drive down uh 64 there through Hickory Nut Gorge, it, it feels like you're deep in the mountains, but apparently that, that gorge is, is the border between Piedmont and mountains. Now the Hickory Nut Gorge area a long time ago, uh, it was populated by the Cherokee people. And I've talked about the Cherokee a lot on the show. You know, growing up, you hear about the Cherokee. If you look at a map of North Carolina Cherokee territory, it looks like the Cherokee had this one little corner in North Carolina. <coughs> but 
But anyway, it looks like the, North, the Cherokee had this one little corner in North Carolina, and they did. But the truth of the matter, the Cherokee territory went almost or all the way to the Mississippi River. So their territory, the Cherokee Nation, was humongous. It's just North Carolina was the far eastern border of it. And Hickory Nut Gorge was no different. That was Cherokee territory. They even talk about, uh, let's see, according to ChimneyRockVillage.com, it says that Hernando de Soto took his army through the Hickory Nut Gorge on his way to the Mississippi River. Then you fast forward a little bit, and you'll see that the Revolutionary War is going on, and American patriots used the gorge as a shortcut to get over to King's Mountain. And I think I covered the Battle of King's Mountain, but I don't remember which episode it was, but I'm, I'm sure I covered it. Now let's move on to the late 1800s, and that's really where the, the Hickory Nut Gorge story really gets going. Also, I don't know if I'm having audio, uh, audio issues or not. My, my lights on my microphone receiver are kind of acting funny, so uh, I guess I'll find out when I go to edit it. Anyway, late 1870s or late 1800s, sometime in the late 1870s, a man named Jerome B. Freeman he spends $25 and buys 400 acres of Hickory Nut Gorge. And yes, we've talked about this before. Back then, you could buy 25 or 400 acres of mountain property for $25. I know uh, when I was probably 17 or 18, I seen an ad for some land up in the North Carolina mountains, and they were selling it for $1,200 an acre. And that was still a really good deal, considering down here in the Piedmont, you're looking at you know, ten to twenty thousand dollars per acre for for subpar land. Anyway, twenty five dollars. He buys four hundred acres. Now I'm going to talk about a I'm going to talk about a few features in the Hickory Nut Gorge a little later. But one very prominent feature, and some of you may know, is Chimney Rock. It's a huge quartzite formation that kind of sticks out from the mountain. And if you're going down sixty four through Hickory Nut Gorge, it's once you get around to the gorge area, it's really hard to miss uh, Chimney Rock. The reason I bring up Chimney Rock now is because Chimney Rock was part of that 400 acres that Freeman purchased. And I think that's just incredible. I mean, I, I love living where I live and it's really beautiful out here. It's really rural. But the only feature I really have on my property is a small creek that really only flows in the wet season. So I can't imagine what it would be like having Chimney Rock in your backyard. But the Freemans, you know, if you know what Chimney Rock looks like, it's very steep. And I guess the, the Freemans, they really weren't very afraid of the steep cliffs. They built the first bridge over, over from the mountain to the, the pinnacle of Chimney Rock. And for 25 cent, you could ride a horse up the mountain and walk across to see out across the land. The steps, the steps going up to the pinnacle, they were added in 1892. Then the Morse family comes into the picture. It was around 1902 when Dr. Lucius B. Morse and his brothers, Hiram and As Ashael, As Asahel, Asahel, A-S-A-H-E-L, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but Dr. Lucius B. Morse and his two brothers, they come to the Hickory Nut Gorge. And like a lot of people who seek out the, the higher elevations up in the mountains, Lucius Morse had tuberculosis and he came up there for the thin air. He was trying to look for some relief for that tuberculosis, and he found Chimney Rock. Well, like a whole lot of people who come to North Carolina for the first time, he fell in love with the place. So Morris and his two brothers, they get some people to back them, and they start a company called the Chimney Rock, called Chimney Rock Mountains Incorporated, and then they set out and start buying land. They buy land all around. They would end up buying around 8,000 acres, but all of it started with one specific purchase. These sweat bees. I don't know if it's everywhere or just in my yard, but I don't know if all y'all know what sweat bees are, but there's hundreds of them out here. I, I've seen one or two in the years past, but this year I was sitting on the porch and uh, probably two or three nights ago, and I bet it was 40 sweat bees around my head, aggravating little suckers. Uh, again, I, I don't know if it's like a year for them or what. But I don't mean to keep cutting in. Anyway, they buy about 8,000 acres in all, and they started with Chimney Rock. They buy Chimney Rock and 64 acres around it from the Freemans for $5,000. And this was, a, this was the, the beginning of what would ultimately become Chimney Rock State Park. But Chimney Rock State Park wouldn't become Chimney Rock State Park for quite some time. 
For now, it's just Chimney Rock Park. But after they opened Chimney Rock Park, things kind of started moving pretty fast after that. They started building a bridge across the Rocky Broad River down below in 1914. And it, it would be dedicated two years later, but then it was destroyed by floodwaters 12 days after the dedication. And then they built a new bridge. In 1915, they start building a road from the, the base of the mountain up to Chimney Rock or close to it. If you, if you go up there, the road doesn't go all the way up to the, the pinnacle. Um, we're going to talk about that in just a second. So uh, 1914, they built the road. 1915, they built the road. 1916, a flagpole would be put up on top of Chimney Rock. And again, if you know Chimney Rock, from way down below, you can see that flag up there. In the 20s, a three-story dining room called the Pavilion is built overlooking Chimney Rock Park. And since then, it's been taken down. They also built an inn at the base of Chimney Rock called Cliff, Cliff Dwellers Inn. And just to clear things up, for this episode, when I'm talking about the base of Chimney Rock, I'm talking about the bottom of the, the pinnacle, not necessarily the bottom of the mountain. So you take the road up the mountain to the parking area, and then you climb the stairs up to the pinnacle, um, if that makes any sense. And remember that quiff, Cliff, I keep saying Quiff. Rem remember the Cliff Dwellers Inn at the base of Chimney Rock? It comes back in for a, a one little factoid here in just a little bit. Anyway, that was uh, the Cliff Dwellers Inn was in the 20s. Around that same time, Morse had an idea of this grand, this giant lake inside of Chimney Rock. He figured if you build this huge lake and you go up to the top of Chimney Rock, the lake would create a, a beautiful view. And, and he was right. I've been up to Chimney Rock a lot of times. And if you go up there, you can really see Lake Lure just stretching out around the mountains. It's, it's unbelievable. And yes, they filmed part of Dirty Dancing at, at Lake Lure. I'll get to that when I get to it. They started building the Lake Lure Dam in 1926. And when you go to Chimney Rock, you have to go by this big old stone entranceway to get across that bridge they built across the, the, the river there. That bridge or that stone entrance was built in 1934. 1946, tuberculosis finally gets Dr. Lucius B. Morse, and he's buried next to Chimney Rock Baptist Church. The following year, 1947, they start making plans to build an elevator to the top of Timmy Rock. But first, they have to tear down that uh, cliff, cliff Dwellers Inn that I was talking about at the base of the of Chimney Rock. Now, about that elevator, I've ridden it, I think, twice. Now, I've been to Chimney Rock a, a lot, but I've only ridden the elevator twice. Most of the time, it seems to be broken down. So most of the time, we just climb the 500 steps to the top of the pinnacle. Um, now, I say it's broken down a lot. Don't let that scare you. It's an elevator inside of a mountain. I mean, it's, it's going to break down. Um, I'm not saying that it drops and then people die. If I didn't look this up, but if, if anybody's died on an elevator, I, at the time of this recording, I am unaware. Well, they finished the elevator shaft and the elevator in 1946. And like I said, the elevator shaft is bored right up through the middle of the mountain, and it lets you off just outside the Sky Lounge, which was built also in 1946. In 1981, that Sky Lounge would burn down, and they would rebuild it in 1982. Now we're at 1987, and the Nature Center is formed. And now I'm going to talk about my the first movie that was filmed up there, and it, it's not Dirty Dancing. Some of you may know where I'm going. In 1991, several scenes from The Last of the Mohicans was filmed at Chimney Rock. And that's still one of my favorite movies. I fell right the hell in love with Madeline Stowe back then, thanks to that movie. And, and I, I still crush pretty hard on Madeline Stowe. Now, if you've never seen The Last of Mohicans, well, first you need to go fix that. I won't spoil it for you, but the climax of the film, uh, that's all Chimney Rock. Leading up to the climax, you can see Hickory Nut Falls, which I'm going to talk about in just a little bit. Um, but then the actual climax of the film, it, it, that's, they're all on top of Chimney Rock. You don't see the chimney itself in the film, but the final chase scene is above the chimney. I think it's called the Skyline Trail. And if you look at a map of the Chimney Rock hiking trails, you can kind of see the Skyline Trail. Chimney Rock is kind of like here if you're watching on YouTube. Skyline is you have to go above Chimney Rock and it goes around the mountain. And it, it In real life and in the movie, it looks pretty treacherous. But the, the climax is all around that mountainside and the movie finally comes to an end or right there at the end at Hickory Nut Falls. And that's 
you know, I said you could see it right before the climax. Well, it ends there too. It, Hickory Nut Falls, it's a 404 foot waterfall just around the way from the chimney. And again, I'm not trying to take away from Chimney Rock. It, it's a 400 foot waterfall for sure, but it's not like Niagara. It's, you know, um, it's pretty dry up there. I mean, it's mountains, so it's wet, but it has a, a really kind of low flow before you decide to make a special trip to Ruther Ruther Rutherford County and go see this 400 foot waterfall. I, I'd Google it first. Um, I've seen it after a hard rain and it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know, it's from a distance. It gets pretty big then, but it's a, it's a low volume waterfall, but it's still really beautiful. I think uh, it's a just over a mile round trip out to the falls and back. So if you're wondering about that, it's not a hard hike, but, um, but it, it is still pretty without a huge, you know, limbo falls flow. It's a, it's a pretty waterfall. Anyway, I didn't mean to get stuck on the waterfall and last the Mohicans. Let's go to 2005. Finally, in 2005, the North Carolina legislature and Governor Mike Easley sign a bill that creates Hickory Nut Gorge State Park. Now, right now, and we're getting to it, right now, Chimney Rock Park is still Chimney Rock Park, but the gorge itself becomes Hickory Nut Gorge State Park. And the following year, in 2006, North Carolina offers $20 million for 1,000 acres that will make up, or they offer $20 million for 1,000 acres of Chimney Rock Park. And this sale would be finalized in 2009, and this ends up making Chimney Rock State Park. So you have Hickory Nut Gorge State Park and Chimney Rock State Park. And now let's go back and talk about Lake Lure for a minute, because I'm not sure if technically Lake Lure is counted as being in the gorge, although I would assume so. When you go around Lake Lure, I mean, it's mountain walls on each side of you. I think I said mountain kind of funny. It's mountain walls on each side of you. and um. So most likely it's in the gorge, but even if it wasn't, Lake Lure and Chimney Rock, they go hand in hand. Like I said, Lake Lure is a 27 mile long lake in the shadow of Chimney Rock. And from above, it looks really incredible. I've taken a bunch of personal pictures from up there. If I can find one of them, I'll cast it up on the screen here. I know I can uh, at least do that without getting sued by anybody, unless, unless my wife gets mad at me if it's one of her pictures. But anyway, yeah, I'll cast it up on the screen if I can find it. Really beautiful view from up there, just like Morris had predicted. But anyway, when they built Lake Lure, like many lakes in our country, there was already a town kind of in the way. The town that's under Lake Lure was called Buffalo. And Buffalo was a, a mining town. Um, they probably done some log in there, but they had to classify it as something. But Buffalo was a mining town on the banks of the Rocky Broad River, and it had a population of about 150. Now, once old Morris decided he was going to build his resort lake there is what he was calling it, the folks in Buffalo, well, they got the boot. And most of them, most of the buildings in Buffalo were tore down before they flooded the lake, but not all of them. They say if you take one of the famous Lake Lure boat tours and the water's clear enough, you can still see the outline of some of the buildings under the water, which is kind of disconcerting. That's, uh, I don't know, I don't have nightmares about sunken towns, but it would be really eerie to to see a roof outline just under the water. And a guy I used to work with, he took one of those boat tours and he swore that he could hear bells out there on the lake. And apparently the, the guide told him that it was the water current ringing the, the bells that were on the old schoolhouse that's still there. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it, I guess it's kind of a cool story. So the lake goes up, gets flooded, and Morris, he gets ready to make a, a great mountain resort there in Lake Lure and, and Hickory Nut Gorge. But the stock market puts a stop to that, and he gives up on the lake and focuses just on Hickory Nut Gorge instead. However, the lake was already there, and people eventually started moving in, and it, it grew into today a, a, a very popular spot. It's not really a, the grand resort that Morris probably had in mind, but... Uh, but it's definitely a really cool place, and there's a lot of cool stuff there. Now, in early September of 1986, a film crew closed in on Lake Lure to start working on a new film that would be called Dirty Dancing. Only a few scenes in the movie were shot there. The rest, I believe, were in New York. The Chimney Rock Camp for Boys at Lake Lure was used for the staff cabins in the movie. 
And this is where Jennifer Gray practices dancing with Patrick Swayze. The gym at that boys' camp was turned into the Kellerman's Ballroom. Eventually, the cabins were tore down, torn down, and, and the gym, it burned down. And so, of course, today, the boys' camp no longer exists. And let's see, um, the scenes on the golf course where she asked her dad for money, that was filmed on the 16th hole of Bald Mountain Golf Course at Rumbling Bald on Lake Lure. And as far as I know, that golf course is still there. And the famous lake scene in the movie where Patrick Swayze lifts uh, Jennifer Grey up over his head, it was not filmed at Lake Lure, though a lot of people, a lot of people think it was. Um, it is in a water source, and naturally you would think it was Lake Lure. I think it was filmed at a lake in Virginia. And you hardcore Dirty Dancing fans, y'all can correct me, but uh, I know for a fact it wasn't North Carolina. I did say some of the filming took place in New York, but I know some of the filming took place in Virginia as well. Anyway, since then, since the movie, Lake Lure has started hosting an annual Lake Lure Dirty Dancing Festival in August. It's a two-day two festival celebrating the movie. I had read that there's live music and there's dancing contests maybe. I know there's dance lessons. And it's just a, a weekend of, of I Love Dirty Dancing. And proceeds from this festival benefit the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network to fight, the, to fight pancreatic cancer. And, you know, if you think that's kind of random, a lot of you know that's what killed Patrick Swayze. And uh, that's really all I have on Hickory Nut Gorge. If you're interested in more uh, Last of the Mohicans, you can check out DuPont State Forest. Um, they filmed some scenes in that movie at Triple Falls and, is it Triple Falls? What's that other waterfall? I can't remember. I want to say it's something Nut Falls too. There's three waterfalls that they filmed at in the last Mohicans, two or three. The big waterfall scene in the movie, that's a real waterfall, but there's not actually a, a cave or cavern behind it. But uh, they also filmed part of Hunger Games around there. I covered the films in one of my episodes. But they, they filmed a lot in North Carolina, Hunger Games, Last Mohicans, Nell, just to name a few. And of course, Dirty Dancing, parts of Dirty Dancing. And I don't mean to go on a rant. A lot of you know I'm a huge movie buff, so I love, uh, I love talking movies. A lot of you may not know when I first decided I wanted to be a podcaster, my first idea was to be a, a movie podcast, even though there's a billion movie podcasts out there. Anyway... If you're ever thinking about visiting Hickory Nut Gorge, it is on Highway 64. Highway 64 goes from Nags Head to Murphy, North Carolina. I mean, it goes all the way out to Arizona, I believe. But in North Carolina, 64 runs from Murphy to Manio. I said Nags Head. That's the, 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 the big catchphrase is from Murphy to Manio on Highway 64. I've been on every mile of Highway 64 in North Carolina. Not all at one time, but. I'll tell you this, if you get up in the mountains on Highway 64, once you get around Chimney Rock and, and Lake Lure, oh, it, it, it's beautiful. Um, I talked about when I was on the interstate, I'd get to Hickory and I'd start seeing the mountains. We do that when we leave around sunlight, around dawn, you know. But a lot of times, if we're going to get a late start and the sun's already up, I'm going to take 64. It's a, it's a far more beautiful ride through the mountains than Interstate 40. Uh, and I'm not going to go on a rant about road trips, but... That's the end of this episode. Don't forget, if you enjoyed the episode, you can rate, review, subscribe. Check the links below to skip all the talking at the beginning. Check out the Facebook group. Check out the YouTube links. Or suggest an episode. And uh, again, I, I don't mind hearing it all from you. Go to YouTube and check out Tasting NC, where my wife joins me and we eat. And uh, anyway, I think that's all I have. So uh, I'll talk to you in a couple weeks.